Welcome again, ladies and gentlemen, my beloved brethren and sistren, to the Tawahado Bible Study Podcast. As always, you can subscribe, share, and support, or as Portuguese speakers say, support. You can subscribe wherever you find this, be it YouTube, Transistor, Apple, Google, Anchor, etc. You can share by copying this link and sharing it with others or by simply sharing the words of God that you hear here with your friends, strangers, and especially enemies. You can support by subscribing to the newsletter, aksum.substack.com, that's A-K-S-U-M dot substack.com, or going to patreon.com slash tawahado, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash T-E-W-A-H-I-D-O. Today I have a special guest with me, my cousin Jonathan, that's because we are reading Genesis 4. As a reminder, we're reading Genesis 4, or Barashit 4, in light of Jude 1 to 13. Jude only has one chapter, so when I say 1 to 13, those are the verses which heavily are referring to both implicitly and ex explicitly the book of Enoch, as well as Genesis, as well as Numbers. And so today, my cousin Jonathan is joining me to go over the story of Cain and Abel, because those are brothers, and so are we. Without further ado, Jonathan. And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of sheep. But Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord, and Abel... He also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass, when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel his brother, and slew him. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. And now art thou cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength, a fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. And Cain said unto the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth, and from thy face shall I be hid. And I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth, and it shall come to pass that every one that findeth me shall slay me. And the Lord said unto him, Therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord, and dwelt in the land of Nod, on the east of Eden. And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived, and bare Enoch, and he filled Builded a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son, Enoch. And unto Enoch was born Irad. And Irad begot Mehujael, and Mehujael begot Methusael, and Methusael begot Lamech. And Lamech took, upon, took unto him two wives. The name of the one was Ada and the name of the other was Zillah. And Ada bore Jabal, 
he was the father of such as dwelt in tents and of such as have cattle. And his brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all such as handle the harp and organ. And Zillah, she also bare Tubal Cain, an instructor of every artificer in brass and iron. And the sister of Tubal Cain was Naama. And Lamech said unto his wives, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice, ye wives of Lamech, hearken unto my speech. For I have slain a man to my wounding and a young man to my hurt. If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, truly Lamech seventy and sevenfold. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bare a son and called his name Seth. For God said, she hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel, whom Cain slew. And to Seth, to him also there was born a son, and he called his name Enos. Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. The, the word of God. Very good. Thank you, Jonathan. As we say in our tradition, may he have you hear his word of life. So there are a number of things that we heard in that passage. I'll give us some big picture themes, and then Jonathan will, will go ahead and go through the verses individually. So first and foremost, we begin not with Cain and Abel, but with Adam, or more specifically, Ha-Adam and Eve. What's funny is when you look at the Hebrew, which I don't know a ton of, but I'm able to read the script in a brunt fashion, you see that some translations translate the first line as man in one place and man in another. Others say Adam in one place and they say man in another. They arbitrarily choose and decide to transliterate or to translate something. The original Hebrew has, for the first instance, Adam or Ha-Adam, and the second instance, Ish. Now, what exactly are the precise differences? How do both of those mean man or human being or groundling? I don't have a full of an understanding of, but I just want to call to your attention that you have to dig deep into the word and understand words like ish and adam reflect slightly different things. And even ha adam and adam or the adam and adam can reflect different things. Next, you see the first coitus of scripture and it's post Edenic. Father Josiah Trenum in his book, Marriage and Virginity According to John Chrysostom, notes this in his comparison between the monastic life or the celibate life and that of the biological bearing of fruit and multiplying, that you do not see the childbirth happening until coitus. And in Eden, you don't see any of that at all. And so it's at least not a necessary component. We're not going to delve into Gnosticism and say that it's sinful, but it is at least not a necessary component and that is something that each individual in their community with the consultation of their community leaders need to reflect upon. Cain, I've heard Father Paul Nadim Tarazi translate as possessor and what a devilish name it is to be called a possessor because the only possessor is supposed to be the Melech who is the king or the possessor or the owner of everything, the earth and the fullness thereof, says the psalmist. I've seen another translation that says Cain is the one with the spear. These are not necessarily in conflict. Oftentimes the way that you gain territory or that you possess things is with spear or with a sword by force and the monopolization of force. 
In contrast, Hebel or Abel or Abel is a fleeting breath, a vanishing breath, the vanity of vanities of the preacher in Ecclesiastes. Cain or Cain is the ground worker. He puts his own labor into the property. Abel is the sheep keeper or the sheep protector or the shepherd. Cain is establishing cities and thus city-states and thus empires and stable agriculture. Abel is in the wilderness. Cain gives some of his goods to God and thus later functionally the needy neighbor. Abel gives his firstborn, which is a foreshadowing of Abraham and a foreshadowing of God the Father himself with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It shows that we do not give some, but we give our first fruits. We give our firstborn. We give our everything to God and to the needy neighbor. Cain is the father of an Enoch. Now I'm named Enoch or Hanok, and Hanok is the dedicated one. In modern Hebrew, it's a, a teacher. All of this has to do with devotion and dedication. Obviously, the first Enoch, the son of Cain, is dedicated or devoted to the wrong thing, to the city and to groundworking. The later Enoch is the son of Jared, is the one who pleases God and the one who I hope to make my life resemble. The fratricide or the brother on brother murder or killing that we see between Cain and Abel is a microcosm of war. It's a mini war. It's what war is writ large. And so when you look at the story of Cain and Abel, you could think of it on an individual level, but I also invite you to think of it on a community versus community level, whether it is Jew and Greek, Jew and Gentile, Ethiopian and American, Greek and Russian, whatever it may be, if the shoe fits, put it on. Because you remember in closing, in the Johnine literature, hatred is not less than but equal to murder. And so fratricide can happen functionally when you hate your brother or your sister or your stranger or your enemy that you do see. And there's no way that you can love your God that you do not see unless you love your needy neighbor, your stranger, your enemy, your brother, your sister that you do see. Jonathan? Uh, thank you, Brother Hinoch, for having having me on. Uh, may uh, the word of the Lord increase, and and uh, may may we both uh, dive dive into His instruction. Uh, I I don't have much to add to that big picture. Um, I uh, want to first give uh, uh, respect to our. Uh, our mutual uh, mentors and teachers, uh, fathers, uh, Paul, Nadine, Tarazi, and uh, Mark Bulos, um, who have uh, taught us to read stories like Genesis 4 uh, as literature. Uh, and by that, I, I mean reading these uh, biblical stories as uh, 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 works of authorship, where every word, uh, every jot or every tittle, if you will, has a function in the context of uh, the larger story that the author is trying to convey. Uh, and the, the contrast to, to reading uh, this as literature would be reading this as a historical account of uh, what, uh, uh, what happened uh, as, an account of people, uh, Adam as a person, and Cain and Abel as people, and what uh, God had had said and and done um, with them. Um, and, and when you read uh, Genesis four as literature, uh, you you pick up uh, little um, uh, little tidbits that help you understand the story and, and help you apply it to your own life um, and. Uh, Hinoch had highlighted you, you. You wonderfully highlighted uh, uh, all of all of those that um, I I would have uh, gone through, but I, I will uh, just 
uh, dig into a, a couple of uh, things that, that you highlighted there. Um, uh, first uh, being the names of Cain and Abel. <clears throat> um, when we read this in English, we uh, think of these names as proper nouns and uh, are really unable to um, uh, re really uh, comprehend the, the, the force of the story uh, when uh, one brother is named Abel, uh, that, that is vanity or vanishing heir, uh, and the other brother is named Cain. Um, so right from the beginning, uh, the author here has uh, given a, a, a dog uh, a bad name, uh, I think is the, the saying uh, in, 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 uh, for, for Americans at least, um, which is that Cain, Cain is given the name of possessor. Uh, he, he, from the beginning, is uh, almost doomed not to follow God's word. And that, that plays out uh, not just in his life, but through his progeny. Um, so I will um, read as literature Genesis 4, 3 to 5 here to, to highlight some of Cain's uh, transgression, which we are uh, to learn from. So this is Genesis 4, uh, 3 to 5. Uh, and in process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. Um, so reading this as literature, we can see uh, that Cain brought of the fruit, whereas Abel brought of the firstlings of his flock. And um, uh, the, the great uh, father John Chrysostom uh, uh, teaches in this verse, and, and I will quote his homilies, and Abel offered of the firstborn of his sheep and of their fat. See how his most pious mind is shown to us and how he did not merely offer sheep, but of the firstborn that is of the most precious and the most excellent. And then of these firstborn, the most precious parts and of their fat. It says that is of the fattest and best. Nothing of the sort is recorded of Cain. He offered sacrifice from the fruits of the earth as though to say, whatever he came across, taking no labor or pains to choose among them. Uh, so uh, so there, 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 you, there you have it. And on top of that, we, uh, we have the teachings of Father Paul Nadim Tarazi, who uh, further highlights the biblical preference for shepherdism over kingship um, and uh, how that is a theme throughout the Bible and a theme that we would not necessarily pick up on if we were just reading this as a historical account of a farmer and his and his brother. Um, but when we read this as literature, we can really pick up on these themes throughout. Um, another uh, uh, theme that, that I uh, wanted to uh, dig into here and, and more expand upon uh, would be Genesis 4 to 6. Um, and this is the uh, Lord having a, a conversation with Cain. And we need to understand here the, the Lord being a, a character in, in this literature trying to teach us something. Um, so uh, beginning from Genesis 4, verse 6, And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? And why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Uh, and uh, this heavily ties into um, uh, themes of, of sin and, and how it can, uh, how it can over, overcome us and how the Lord here is trying to teach Cain not to, to fall into that trap. But um, as we know in the story uh, ahead of time, he falls into it anyways, and he ends up 
um, murdering his brother um, because his he, he's 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 unable to to deal with with his sin, um, and, and it, it, it twists his mind, and, and he's not able, as as God says, to to rule over him. Uh, the the him referring to to sin there. Um, uh, and and throughout the throughout the Bible, uh, it, it refers to this struggle with sin and really, um, you know, me- metaphorically uh, uh, treats sin as uh, a personified uh, character uh, him- himself or, or a spirit that that can overcome us if if we're not careful, uh, and so. Abel goes on to uh, to die, uh, as as was his name, um, vanishing breath. Um, and Cain, uh, the possessor, goes on to possess. In the story, um, he he has this trial with God, where God is asking him uh, questions. Um, uh, you, know, you know, where where is your brother? And from that, we get the very um, often quoted line, um, I don't know, am I my brother's keeper? And uh, reading this as literature, we're able to, to um, you know, ask questions, you know, why is, why is God, you know, the, this character all-knowing um, sitting here asking Cain questions about where his brother is? Like, doesn't he know he just murdered him? Um, but this is uh, really for the reader, for us to be able to hear Cain's response and his, how unrepentant it is and how uh, sin is, is still overcoming him. Uh, and his, his eventual punishment is uh, to be uh, cast out of the presence of the Lord. Um, so uh, I will just read the, the verses uh, quickly here. Um, this is Genesis 4, 8 to 16. Uh, and Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. And now thou art cursed from the earth, which has opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. Uh, and so his, his punishment is then uh, that he's cast out of the presence of the Lord. In, in verse four sixteen, it says, And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. And again, uh, when we read this as literature, we understand that his punishment uh, being cast out of the presence of the Lord is really uh, that he would no longer walk in the precepts of the Lord, of the Lord's law. Um, uh, how, how else could we understand the, the presence of the, of the Lord here and what the author is trying to convey if the Lord is uh, able to be anywhere and everywhere um not only in uh in a you know in in this uh, in, a, in, a, in a sense of mental uh, uh uh thoughtfulness of the lord um but physically you know the creator of heaven and earth he, he can be in any any part of this uh, uh any part of this earth or, or in the heavens where the, the lord pleases um, so to be outside of the presence of the Lord is not so much to be uh, in, an, in another physical space as it is to uh, no longer walk in the in the Lord's uh, in the Lord's law that that He gave us to walk in. And um, further reading this as literature, Cain uh, goes on even to uh, really live up to his name by. Uh, setting up a, a new city he's the first uh he's the first city builder and he um he takes two wives and in, in a very kingly fashion and uh has these three sons um uh, that he 
uh, sets up as uh, different uh, uh, different functions within his own city, uh, which is dedicated to him. And he gives this very violent uh, poem uh, at the end of Genesis four that that we read through, um, where he where he says. Uh, uh, you know, for I have slain a man to my wounding, a young man to my hurt. If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, truly uh, Lamech seventy and sevenfold. And this is uh, Lamech, the the son of Cain, um, the the builder of the of the first city. Um, and, and so he 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 goes on to to continue to be a possessor. Uh, he he never he never repents. He never overcomes uh, the the sin. Uh, from uh, what what se was seemingly in innocuous uh, jealousy of of his brother um, over not being accepted for for giving his for giving his uh, for giving his sacrifice unto the Lord, um, but the uh, the chapter ends um, so gracefully with the Lord's erasure of this whole story in that. Uh, God sets up a, a new seed uh, for Adam through Seth. Uh, although uh, Cain goes on to build a city and has progeny uh, through Lamech, uh, in verse 425, we hear no more of Cain and his progeny, but instead it changes to, uh, and I will read from Genesis 425, and Adam knew his wife again, and she bare a son, and called his name Seth, for God said, "She hath appointed me another seed of instead of Abel, whom Cain slew." And to Seth, to him also there was born a son, and he called his name Enos. Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. And I will uh, uh, comment here just to throw in uh, that uh, Father. Paul Tarazi teaches that uh, uh, this ending to verse 26 is a, a bit of a mistranslation. Uh, then began men to call upon the name of the Lord in the original Hebrew. Uh, men are only a passive actor, and uh, the Lord is the one who allows men to call upon his name. In other words, allows them back into the presence of, of the Lord, which was Cain's punishment. Um, if we remember, Cain's punishment for killing his brother was that he went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod. Uh, but here we see that the, the Lord, through Seth, uh, has uh, allowed uh, men once again to be within the presence of the Lord, that is, to walk in his law. Uh, Thank, Thank you so much, Jonathan. In the biblical Hebrew, toda, uh, two points I have before we close out here that really stuck out to me about what you said. And it's so funny because it's, it's, it's related to things that he and I were discussing earlier today. We have a Bible study for my Sunday school, the Virgin Mary's Parish in Los Angeles under the Ethiopian Orthodox Tawahado Diocese here of Southern California and Alaska. And we, we've been studying the Acts of the Apostles chapter 16. I mean, we've been studying the whole book, but today we covered chapter 16. And when we were having that discussion, in an off discussion, Jonathan and I were discussing his biblical name with my former understanding and Guz and having not properly heard his baptismal name or actually seen it written rather than hearing it. I originally used to think it was Sa'ale Selassie, which would be the cognate of the biblical name Saul, which means to ask, to plead, to petition, to beg. And it's funny because that name is the beggar or the pleader, the petitioner of the Trinity. And I knew the Trinity part was correct. And for a long time, I told Jonathan that was his baptismal name. I was wrong. Recently, I heard it again, especially when our grandmother passed. And it is Sahela Selassie, which sounds very similar, but it's actually spelled with a different S. It's spelled with the sin or sheen that is common to the Hebrew script or the Hebrew alphabet that they've been using since Babylonian captivity. And it, uh, it kind of looks like a W in the 
English script or the Latin script, but it represents this SH. And that word, sahala or shahala, depending on the pronunciation of the age, means the forgiveness of the Trinity. And so in the same way that the men were not calling upon the Lord, but the Lord permitting them to call upon him, Jonathan is not the pleader of the Trinity, but Jonathan is simply the forgiveness of the Trinity. He is a passive agent in the process of God. And I, I like that a lot. Another point that stood out to me, a translation point from when Jonathan was reading is, as you can tell from the beautiful English that he read for you, he was reading aloud the King James Version, the KJV. I had a few versions in front of me. One of the versions I read from earlier to point out the Ha Adam and Ish was a Hebrew translation available at yakovish.github.io. But I have before me also an English translation of the Septuagint. And in this English translation, where Jonathan read a fugitive and a vagabond, which is a personification of what is going on, in this English uh, translation of the Septuagint, you see moaning and trembling, which are generic ideas. So earlier today, in Acts chapter 16, you hear people in a fuss because they're losing their money because of Paul's mission and because Apollo is being messed up with the oracle at Delphi. So the oracle at Delphi representing Apollo is the person or the deity that the people claim they're representing. But really, I said they're representing Mammon or Mammon. And so Jonathan and I had a whole discussion about how Mammon or Mammon is a spirit or a demon or a god of money and other translations say money by itself. So is it a generic idea? Or is it a personified person or deity or spirit or demon? It's something to reflect on, and it's just one more way of encouraging you all to get to the original biblical languages so that you can have more and more understanding of the life-giving word of God. One more appreciation for Jonathan, and glory to God for all things.